Welcome to Startup Elevator Pitch Competition. Welcome. Okay. We have a five startups that's going to do the competition. But before we do that, let me introduce our judges, okay? First, a vice president of Samsung Electronics, Thomas Ko. Thomas Ko leads global strategy of Samsung services at headquarters. Okay, next up is Mr. Sokju Lee. Okay. He's a member of corporate development group at Samsung Electronics. Okay. Last but not least, Mr. Homayun Shahinfar. Okay. He leads Open Innovation Group at Samsung Research America based in Mountain View. Okay. Now I'm going to invite um, Vice President Thomas Ko to, to let you know, to explain what criteria they're going to look for when they judge and tally votes. Okay, great. Thank you very much for coming. We got five great startups, and we're going to look for number one, overall pitch quality of the presenters. How relevant those uh, solutions are to SDC team, which is connected thinking. Unique differentiation of their products and attitude and overall approach, approach. And then finally, clarity and feasibility of the vision. I believe at the end of the day, you know, whether they are Koreans or not will be important. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Whether they're based in Korea or not, that's, 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 no. But at the end of the day, it is really about their their you know five minute elevator pitch, and we really don't have any kind of bias opinions on any particular areas. We're gonna be looking at those presenters on their their own unique ideas and their passion. And at the end of the day, let's have a lot of fun. Great. All right, all right. Okay, first up, we have Mr. Raj. Come on up, please. Mr. Raj is the CEO and co-founder of Passage AI. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, the company name is Passage AI. So what we do is we have an AI-driven natural language understanding platform for building conversational interfaces. Now, if that sounds like a lot of buzzwords, uh, I plan to do a, a live demo, uh, actually a recorded demo. Uh, so the company was founded uh, last year, about a year ago. Um, and uh, we launched our product uh, earlier this year. Uh, we have a number of customers, including Kohl's, that launched their chatbot on Messenger uh, a few months back. You can check it out for yourself if you go to Facebook Messenger and search for Kohl's. Uh, Udacity, the e-learning site, uh, also launched us a couple of months back. You can check that out also by going to udacity.com. And we actually built a chatbot for ourselves uh, for Passage.ai, so if you go to our site, uh, you'll see a chatbot that'll tell you what we do, um, you know, what our solution costs and things like that. We also have a number of uh, telecom companies and financial services companies that are um, piloting our product. So the reason we started this company is because of a couple of things. Firstly, uh, AI has finally come of age. Uh, we all are seeing that. Secondly, a once in a decade shift in platform usage uh, is happening. In 95, the PC to the online um, in our transition, 07 online to smartphones, and then so 2016, the move to messaging platforms. Applications of AI, we all have seen it, self-driving cars, drones that deliver packages, and then the shift in platform usage. Uh, just between Facebook Messenger, WeChat, and, and WhatsApp, there are three billion users on messaging platforms. And then you have the voice devices like Alexa, and Bixby, and, and Google Home. Um, so, um, you know, there are other players that offer chatbot solutions, but uh, most of them uh, just offer a bot builder, or they offer an AI solution, or they offer a bot deployment solution. We offer all three in one tool, and you can build a chatbot like Old State without having to write a single line of code. Uh, the bot builder is all UI driven. Uh, this is the uh, screenshot of that. Um, and then once it's built, uh, you can build a bot in as little as five minutes and I'll show you a demo of that. Once it's built, you can deploy it anywhere. Uh, it works natively on SMS, on Messenger, and soon we plan to support uh, uh, Bixby as well. And the reason we find Bixby pretty impressive is that uh, you know, it, it 
not just works on tech devices like phones and smartwatches and so on. It works on refrigerators and dishwashers. So imagine a scenario where you build a bot using our tool and you, um, you know, open up the refrigerator and you find uh, milk missing, right, or milk uh, over. You can just order from uh, Walmart. Uh, just say, Walmart, uh, get me some milk. Or you might be in front of your dishwasher and then you're out of uh, detergent or on your washing machine. And then you can just say, uh, hey, uh, uh, Walmart, where's my order? And then it'll tell you uh, the uh, order shipped two days back. You're going to receive it tomorrow, and so on. So, so let me show you a demo. Google, talk to Alexa now. Hi, Alexa. Please talk to me. How are you doing today, Google? I am doing great. I love this conference. Can you tell me a joke? Why did the chicken cross the road? You've said that joke a million times. You are a robot. And you are a human. Yeah, right. So just to, um, so I can explain. Our tool is not used to, uh, you know, to have Alexa talk to Google. That's not the purpose of the tool. But the way we did this, uh, we did this in five minutes, that demo. Uh, we, had, we built one bot with Alexa talking to Google, another one with Google talking to Alexa. We took the responses of one and made, the, made it the utterances of the others. So they could be having a pretty long conversation, but I only had 30 seconds, so, uh, so that's how that bot was built. Uh, and then in terms of AI, I'm um, running out of time a little bit. Uh, so uh, we have we built some fairly sophisticated deep learning models using uh, a technique called LSTM. So that's what's used to understand natural language. Uh, you, we also have entity and attribute extraction. So if you say something uh, on, at Coles, for example, if you say, uh, I'm looking for a red dress for my daughter's prom, it will actually extract the entity's dress the occasion prom, color red, and, uh, and because you said daughter, it's going to show you uh, dresses for juniors. So that's the level of uh, entity and attribute ex extraction we've done. Uh, we also built our own sentiment classifier. Uh, we tried using other sentiment classifiers, and we found that in a retail example, uh, if you say, what's the return policy, it returns actually a fairly negative sentiment. So we actually built our own uh, classifier. Uh, we also have a knowledge base, which is a pretty common use case. Uh, we have one of the largest uh, banks in the world that's actually uh, using our product to offer customer service, which is actually probably the, one of the most common use cases for a chatbot to be able to automate customer service and reduce costs and improve uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, finally, we do things like speech to text, uh, context and memory. Uh, so we built this entire stack uh, from the ground up. Uh, we do use things like TensorFlow and Stanford NLP and so on, but we built deep learning models ourselves, trained it with uh, uh, nearly 20 petabytes of data for many different use cases. Uh, so what we have is an end-to-end -end bot building tool, right? So it's, this is not just uh, something that sits on the side. It actually integrates with all ERP systems. It, it integrates with all you know, systems like from Oracle, Salesforce. So if you want to hand off to a live agent, when the bot is not able to understand what you're saying, It'll say, let me connect you with a live agent. And then we seamlessly integrate with Salesforce and Freshdesk and Zendesk and, and all uh, solutions. Uh, we also integrate with backend services. So we can actually uh, fetch the content uh, from your site. Uh, we also have a built-in scraper that's part of the tool. So you can just point to your site, and then uh, it'll create a conversational interface for the site. Um, and then finally, all the messaging platforms, all the voice devices uh, work seamlessly, like I said. You build it once, you don't have to do any changes. It works automatically and natively. Uh, you saw the Alexa Google Home demo. Your time is up, Mr. Raj. Did yes. you want to make any final remarks? Yes. Uh, the space is uh, crowded, uh, and people have asked me, what's your differentiator? And I will actually refer you to a, a third-party analyst firm in, in Germany that was commissioned by four large telcos to, find, uh, to evaluate the space. They found that a lot of companies have good bot building features, and a, bot, a lot of companies have good AI features, but only a handful of us uh, have good bot building and AI features, both components you need to build a chat bot. Thank you. All right, judges, uh, questions from the judges.
Thank you very much, Ravi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ravi, one quick question. How many languages do you support currently? Yeah, so we support uh, over 100 languages. So we're actually working with a telco company in Europe uh, for in German and Greek. Uh, we're working with a company in Asia, um, a large brand, uh, to actually build a chatbot in, uh, in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, so we support 100 languages. Next question, please. Thanks, Ravi. Um, just in terms of the verticals and, and customers, you seem to service a number of different verticals. So how are you supporting all of those different verticals, and how long does it take your customers to get up? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So we're not a horizontal solution, but we're a multi-vertical solution. So we actually build models for different use cases, and some use cases cut across multiple verticals. For example, customer service automation cuts across pretty much every vertical. Uh, it's things like form filling cuts across many verticals. Uh, even things like finding a store, it applies to finding a doctor, finding a, a restaurant. So we build models for different use cases and deploy them vertically. Final question for me is that how do you make money? Uh, so it's a SaaS model. Uh, so actually the, the customers I mentioned are actually paying us. Uh, so it is a monthly licensing fee. Uh, and uh, we typically waive the uh, setup fees uh, because it's fairly easy to build the bot. We configure the APIs and give it to the customer, and they build the bot, but it's a monthly uh, licensing fee. All right, thank you very much. Please, round of applause for Mr. Raj. Because this is competition, just to be fair, we are giving every um, contestant seven minutes. So. Please um, understand if, if I have to cut in the middle, okay? Next up, we have Mr. William Coven for Reduced Micro. Please, round of applause for Mr. Coven. Hi, I'm... I'm William Coven with Reduced Energy Microsystems, or REM for short. So right now, AI is changing everything. It's the future, and it's making our lives better. But I feel very strongly that AI needs to move from the cloud to the edge. Our devices are more powerful and more useful to us if they understand what's going on around us. And as humans, we've largely developed to use our eyes. And so we've built our world to be navigated by sight. And so our devices, our systems, our robots, they need to be able to see. But they need to be able to understand what they're seeing. And they need to be able to understand the context around it. And so over the last couple of years, there have been some amazing developments in machine learning and neural networks that make all of this possible. But right now, a lot of those advanced techniques are stuck in the cloud. It's one thing to just look at a simple image and pull out a sign and translate the text, which is incredible. But a lot of the more advanced techniques that need to happen in real time uh, need to happen on the edge, on the device. And uh, right now, we're very limited in what's possible. It might just be a little bit annoying when Siri can't answer a question because she doesn't have an internet connection. But it's vital that a doctor out in the countryside with limited internet can still use advanced machine learning techniques to diagnose patients. It might be frustrating when Google can't plot a route for you, but it's dangerous when a drone loses a connection and crashes and might even hurt someone. So we need to bring the power of AI in the cloud to edge devices. And that's why we've built the R1, uh, the ultimate chip for computer vision and embedded AI, for bringing all these uh, AI applications to the edge. So the R1 is a complete solution. We can run uh, state-of-the-art neural networks at very high frame rate, but we can also run all the other software you need to build your next generation of smart devices. From bare metal to Linux, we support the environments you already use. And the R1 can run uh, AI applications that right now need a desktop or the cloud. And the R1 can run those applications at the edge. And we're really excited to see what new devices people are going to build with this capability. Um, so uh, 
this is a developer conference, and so I think it's important to talk about what the software looks like. And with our SDK, you can compile your neural networks from TensorFlow or CAFE uh, to run on the R1 seamlessly. Um, we provide highly optimized uh, vision libraries. Um, we provide a full tool chain to make it easy to utilize every part of the chip. So we think it's important that you don't have to worry about nitty gritty optimization. And instead, you can focus on building your next smart device, whether it's a home speaker, um, a smart camera, an industrial robot, a drone, whatever your next product is, the R1 can add intelligence to it. But performance isn't everything, and we focused very heavily on efficiency. And so the R1 can run AI applications using a fraction of the power of any other chip on the market right now. So using the RAM SDK, it's possible uh, to build your application to use the bare minimum power necessary for the task at hand. So how do we do it? Well, the R1 uh, can trade off the inherent efficiency that we've designed into the chip to give you increased power, um, but only when you need it. And as soon as possible, return back to uh, its highly efficient processing state. Now, every part of the chip can run and be optimized separately. So if you're running a task that uses an intense neural network, but you don't need the other resources on the chip, you can devote more power uh, to running the neural network while saving uh, energy by keeping other pieces idle. Now, this isn't sleep modes. This is uh, meant for always-on computing. This is meant for devices that always need to be aware. So the R1 uh, can run always-on and just sipping power. So now imagine if the Google Clips could have a battery life of a day or a week instead of three hours. See, we think you shouldn't have to compromise battery life to make a device smart. We think it's very important that you can uh, both build a smart device and then take it with you anywhere you go. And the R1 is a platform that will let you do that. So how do we do it? Well, we design with uh, a patented and proprietary technology we call resilient asynchronous design. Now, it's not very important how we do it. As developers, what you need to know is that you can use the R1 and your applications will be fast and efficient. Now, we want to get this to you, get this to market as soon as possible. And so we'll have samples early next year. So if this is interesting to you, please come talk to me afterwards and uh, I'll see if we can arrange to get you a development board as soon as they're available. So, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? All right. Questions from judges. You said you'll have a Is this on? Sorry. Yep. Uh, so you plan to have development boards early next year. That's right. So your tape out schedule will be early next year. When do you plan to have the SDK available for development? Uh, we plan to have the SDK available um, at the beginning of next year, um, so sometime in Q1, and we'll have the development boards available in Q2. Thank you. Okay. Next question. With uh, all the machines around us is mm -hmm. becoming more powerful mm -hmm. and, and things like that, it seems like power consumption maybe is not necessarily a big topic. Why did you focus on power consumptions that much on your chip? So, uh, Personally, we get very frustrated with the battery life of most of our devices. Um, I think the fact that the Google Clips still only has a three-hour battery life shows that what's out there right now just isn't good enough. Um, and we need to be able to continue to increase the amount of processing we can do, but still reduce the energy consumption so our devices last more than a day. I mean, having to charge my watch every night is incredibly frustrating. Um, but beyond that, um, we've actually found in a lot of applications, people are thermally limited. So it's power, but not from a power source that matters. It's the heat dissipation. In many mass consumer devices, uh, in small plastic enclosures, you can't dissipate very much heat. And you have to keep the device cool if it has a camera sensor or the camera sensor stops functioning right. Um, so we've actually found thermals to be one of the biggest driving factors in uh, people's design decisions. Mr. Shahim for. Uh, what is your business model? Is it licensing? Um, it's mostly not, although we are exploring that with some partners. Uh, we are building an SOC that we plan to ship to customers. All right, round of applause for William Coven.
Next up, we have Mr. Lenny Konsevich from Red Rock Biometrics. Please welcome Mr. Konsevich. Hello. Hello? Yeah, it's better. Okay, so uh, no one these days needs to be convinced about uh, benefits of biometrics. You use your body as a key to access the assets you are uh, authorized to access. And, uh, but today, m most of us still uh, carry keys in the pocket and uh, type passwords. What's the reason? The problem is that uh, most of biometrics, uh, there are two kinds of biometrics. The first three, uh, three in this table uh, are secure biometrics, but all of them require special uh, hardware. There are two biometrics at the bottom, face and voice, which, uh, which really piggyback on the uh, embedded devices in the pers uh, embedded camera and uh, microphone in the uh, personal devices, but they are considered as in insecure. And here comes our Palm ID biometrics, which both secure and works on any device. So as follows from the name of the uh, technology, uh, it is based on Palm. And if you look at the Palm image, it is just a very large fingerprint. And with the camera, you can capture a lot of detail from the palm and use it for identifying the, the particular person. Uh, let me show a demo how it works. So here, I select a user, which was me, show palm, get identified. Again, do it. You see how it is fast and seamless. Now I select a different person uh, and uh, show my palm and uh, uh, identification uh, fails. So what are advantages of Palm ID? Uh, it works on any device with RGB or and infrared camera with minimal resolution. Uh, palm scanning is 400 times more secure than uh, Apple Touch ID and about 20 times more secure than Apple Face ID. Uh, also, it provides great user experience. It is fast, convenient, and, which is important, touchless. Uh, and it is extremely robust. It works at very low, actually, it works in pitch dark the light from the device is sufficient for doing biometrics. It works under direct sunlight. It works with dirty and greasy hands. It can tolerate scars. And to compare this technology with FACE, which is our kind of main competitor, uh, Palm is rarely exposed and photographed. It is a pretty private part of the body. Whereas the face is all over the internet and you can build three-dimensional model and try to spoof the system. Also, palm shows intention rather than presence. So when you show the palm, you want something. Whereas you, you show your face, then you have to make a next step to show your intention. So it is quite important difference for uh, some use cases. So the use cases here, there is a lot of use cases. In this case, uh, on this slide, we just show Samsung branded devices. Uh, and practically all of these devices have cameras and you can uh, authenticate, unlock the device with uh, uh, Palm ID. Uh, let me focus on a few of them. For instance, with the car, you get in the car, you show your palm, and the engine starts. It's pretty cool. Uh, uh, automotive companies are really excited by this possibility. Uh, the second is mobile phone. 
S8 uh, mobile phone has infrared camera. And in this case, we can combine RGB and infrared information. And in this case, our accuracy, so-called false acceptance rate, will be one per trillion. One per one trillion. And it is, will, will be completely in, impossible to fake it with infrared component. So it will be a perfect solution for payments, for instance. Uh, and the uh, last uh, example is ARVR. This is our killer application. If you think about, uh, so th th there are di different circumstances when you need to uh, authentic authenticate user with, uh, using uh, ARVR headset. In, uh, for uh, uh, most of the ARVR headset have uh, cameras looking forward. So you just take the sorry, sorry. So you just show your palm to the camera, and you sign in. That's very simple, and easy, and seamless. And uh, we uh, you have one minute. Thank you. Uh, and uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and there, there is no alternative to that, because face is covered, typing uh, in virtual keyboard is a pain in the neck. Uh, so we have, uh, so this is a slide about the product. We provide SDK for all systems, uh, standalone or server-based, and its integration is very simple. Uh, we have a lot of customers. Uh, we have three licensing contracts contracts with pretty large ID provider, uh, security, uh, manufacturer of security token and cell health care. Uh, we have partnership with Epson for AR and we have partnership with Wells Fargo for we build security application and other applications for them. Uh, finally, the company is founded in 2015 based in San Francisco, has seven employees and we are uh, growing right now and hiring people. So I hope I managed to convince you that this is the future and we will enjoy it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions from judges? Yes, sir, Shahimpa, you want to go first? What uh, sort of anti-spoofing do you have? Do you detect liveness? How do you detect we, that? We have two uh, kind of, uh, uh, two, two, uh, Incarnation, uh, two versions of uh, liveness. Uh, liveness. If we deal only with RGB, we have uh, three, uh, we detect three-dimensional structure of the palm, and we, we, if we have RGB and infrared light, then we detect the vein part pattern, which is very hard to fake. Um, thanks for the presentation. I'm not familiar with the palm as a unique identifier. What studies have been done around That's this? a good question. So there, there were studies which show that identical twins uh, can be distinguished uh, with uh, palm, palm pattern. And we tried actually our technology on identical twins and it, is, it works. Uh, for, for instance, Apple Face ID doesn't distinguish identical twins. And what is the unique identifiers that you're looking at on the palm? Is it the uh, just lines? The lines are different for even for identical twins. They they are closer than between two random people, but they are different. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I see the uh, consumer adoptions, right? And then showing a palm as an identifier, right? I mean, either is whether it's a, you put the in the phone or. If VR is doing like this, it seems a little odd. I mean, what do you think about usability, user experience perspective? So we have uh, user acceptance testing, and actually the participants just call us, and uh, whenever we meet them, they ask when this technology will be widespread. They really liked it. You know, for AR, VR, there is nothing better than that because there is no alternative. For, for the phone, you can show it to the frontal, cam uh, frontal camera or for the back camera, depending on your preferences. 
Uh, it works for any camera, actually. And also, it provides the same experience for phone, for laptops, for instance, for IoT devices, for anything. For instance, banks are very interested in this technology because it provides uniform experience across the whole spectrum of devices. All right, round of applause for Mr. Kansevich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, please don't take the pointer. <laughs> okay. Next up, we have Mr. Kelvin Liu and Ms. Anali Gold from Unified. Kelvin Liu is a President and Chief Strategy Officer, and Anali is a Vice President at Unified. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the organizers of the conference and to our judges uh, for including us in this, uh, in this event. And thank you to all of them and congratulations to all of our, 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 our fellow co-presenters and contestants. Uh, very impressive stuff. Um, my name is Calvin Louie. I'm the president of Unified. And joining me is... Annalie Gould, Vice President, Strategic Accounts. So before we get into exactly what Unified does, uh, I have a few questions for the group. Uh, these little devices that we carry around with us that we call smartphones, uh, they're actually mini computers. Uh, and, when, and when you think about the concept of connected thinking uh, and connected intelligence, uh, the very powerful thing about these mini computers is that they're always on, they're always with us, and they're self-aware. So when you think about, we're a little bit different than most of the other companies that are presenting today because we're not going to be talking about necessarily consumer-related activities, but marketer-related activities. So when you think about the consumer engagement paradigm where they're always connected, what does that result in? It's a lot of data. A lot of marketers call, talk about data exhaust. We think about this as actually a data fountain because of the level of connectedness that's in there. So quick question, how many hours a day do you think the average person spends on mobile and social activities? Thanks for asking, Calvin. Uh, seven hours per day. Seven hours sounds like a lot, doesn't it? Uh, because mobile and social are inextricably linked. Well, exactly how much is that? Well, it's more than the average consumer sleeps per night and about the same amount of time that they spend either at work or at school. That's a lot of time. Explains a lot about these usage and data numbers. Facebook itself has 2 billion monthly active users. 1.3 billion of them come back every single day. And they generate over 8 billion video views per day and billions more in engagements, comments, shares, and communications. Talk about connected. And that doesn't even consider the other big social networks like Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Overall, each one of these networks generates a larger audience and more engagements than the Super Bowl does. And they do this every single day. Just think about that for a second. So do marketers care about this? Absolutely. And they're voting with their dollars and their attention. Social advertising is estimated to be over $50 billion next year. And is the fastest growing channel in terms of advertising and marketing growing at over 25 to 30% every single year. With all that utilization and all those dollars invested, that's generating a lot of data. So much so that the estimate is that markers will spend one third of their marketing budgets on technology support managing that data, understanding that data, and then managing all those billions of dollars of investments. But today, the supply chain of how you get from idea to communication to a consumer is very, very fragmented and inefficient. If you were to guess how many companies are involved in this, this diagram here shows you how many companies help, quote unquote, manage social today. Anley, how many companies on average touch a social advertising campaign from beginning to end? According to my calculations, uh, up to 12, and on average, six companies touch an average social media campaign. That's a complex supply chain. We have, over, we have several billion dollars of data in our platform today. And on average, 
every single campaign has 6.1 companies that touch a campaign. That leads to a lot of inefficiencies and leakage. Well, how much leakage is there? 42 cents out of every dollar of marketing budgets actually goes to managing overhead costs. So, this was actually a study released by the Association of National Advertisers at the beginning of this year. 42% of marketing dollars actually don't make it to the publisher to communicate to consumers. It's actually utilized in overhead costs for technology partners and vendors along the way, and that's what we talk about, supply chain leakage. So, if you're a global marketer with many brands, many partners, many initiatives, with millions of consumers like a Samsung, this is what the social ecosystem might look to you. You own many, many brands, running hundreds of millions of dollars of campaigns across multiple geographic locations, working with dozens of partners, agencies, and publishers. The data coming out of this ecosystem literally looks like this. There are downloads of CSVs in Excel, all disparate data in different silos, and none of them organize in the way you think about your business. So, that's what introducing the unified platform does. The unified platform brings data together. We transform that into this. Our machine learning algorithm automatically categorizes all that disparate data coming from all the different silos and organizes it in a way you think about your business from a company to business unit to brand to marketing initiative to partners, vendors, and ROI. And that is essentially what we do. So this is what we call, when you map out the marketing supply chain, we call that connected intelligence. So when you think about connected thinking, it's not just about the consumer, but it's about the marketer spending billions of dollars to reach those consumers to impact the way they think and to impact the way they, they behave. One of our customers is a global CPG brand they have 70 different brands running hundreds of millions of dollars of marketing campaigns in social every year. Okay, you have 30 seconds. They work with... Oh, is it three minutes? <laughs> uh, they work with dozens of, of partners across the ecosystem. We mapped all of this and found tens of millions of dollars of waste in their supply chain. So our mission is to deliver an enterprise-grade solution to global marketers, that gives them transparency, efficiency, and empowerment to eliminate waste and maximize investments. And these are the people that we serve. You can see these are global brands with billions of dollars at play across multiple brands and multiple geographic areas. Thank okay, you. Okay, time's up. Sorry about that. Round of applause. Okay, questions from the judges. Thanks. In terms of the, the data, you talked a lot about social. Do you also work with other data sources as well, or how difficult is it to add additional data sources? Yeah, so today we focus on social data, connecting all the social data, but we can also ingest first-party data. Uh, so what that means is any of your CRM list, subscriber list, anything like that, we can connect those first-party data sets to the social data and essentially extract and validate what you know and enrich what you know. Uh, actually, one of the, uh, the partners you have downstairs, iHeartRadio, is a big customer of ours, and they leverage our platform to understand their listener audience base based upon social data. You talked about inefficiency in the uh, supply chains and how you actually can save those money right, for them, but at the end of the day, you also get paid, right? So in terms of your revenue model compared to the cost reductions, uh, so what is it? I mean, you're, you're saving about 50% of the cost? by using your platform versus all other supply chains, or what is? So our revenue model is a combination of SaaS license fees with professional services. Uh, so we price, uh, much like most other business intelligence platforms, based on volume of data managed. Uh, so it's a flat uh, annual license fee. Uh, we sign contracts between one and five years. Uh, and uh, the, the, the benefit that that saves to the customer inures to their benefit. Uh, so uh, one of our customers says, uh, very simply, I get eight figures back for seven figures investment. I'll do that all day. Oh, you're good? All right. Thank you very much. For, for one more time. Thank you.
Okay, the next one is the last one. Please welcome Matthew Lowe for Zero Key. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm Matt Lowe. I'm CEO and founder of Zero Key. Um, if the last couple of years are an indication, we all know that virtual reality and augmented reality are coming and they're going to be big. But today, virtual reality is too inaccessible for mainstream consumers. Most people don't actually use virtual reality. If we look at the market and some of the products in the market, uh, we can see at one end of the spectrum on the desktop uh, PC side, we have a couple uh, products such as the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, uh, but these products are quite large. They're bulky, they're tethered experiences. You have a cord running to your computer. Uh, you often have to permanently install uh, base stations on your wall. So it's not very user friendly. And they tend to be quite expensive too. At the other end of the spectrum, on the mobile VR side, you have companies like Samsung, for example, that has the Gear VR that have uh, much more cost effective solutions but usually not providing room scale tracking and some of the features that you would expect to be able to do in VR. Um, this means you can't necessarily reach out and grab an object in VR. You can't stand up and walk around the room in VR, which is something people expect. And I think some of the higher quality experiences demand you have this capability. So right now in mobile VR, this is actually really elusive. And uh, that's where zero key comes in. We've developed a new technology that provides room scale tracking uh, for mobile VR. This means with our technology, whether it's a Gear VR or any other mobile headset, you can put it on, walk around, reach out, interact with objects, have those objects interact back with you. Uh, we've designed it specifically for mobile. So it's really inexpensive. Uh, it's really, really portable. And uh, you can see here in the picture the way uh, we have six little beacons. And basically, they're so small, they actually store within the headset when you're not using it. And then when you're ready to go into VR, you simply take the, the beacons out and you put them on the ground in the room around you. At no particular location, the system itself auto configures. There's no wires to plug in or turn on or anything like that. It's completely automatic. So you just take them out and then you go into VR and you have full room scale capability, just like the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift. Now I'm going to show you a quick demo video. Uh, I'm going to preface it by saying that it's actually a very early stage integration of our technology with Unity. Uh, the main thing to take away is not necessarily the gameplay, but the uh, fact that it's running on a Gear VR. It's running live, completely wireless, all on battery power. Like I said, it's very early stage integration, uh, but you could see the, the translational movements going through um, as our engineer moved and made all the rotations, everything. And that's key if you want to actually interact with objects in your virtual environment. You have to have that. Uh, accuracy is obviously very key in, in virtual reality. Uh, you want things to behave as you expect. You don't want things to be knocked over if your hand's not knocking them over. Uh, so what we did, we wanted to compare our technology with the kind of market leader in room scale positioning right now, which uh, in my opinion is the HTC Vive. So we actually built a little test setup here where we put our tracker in the center of an HTC Vive and then we captured data from both devices simultaneously to see what the, the difference was. And so here are those uh, results in real time. And so this is uh, one of our interns here. He's doing a figure eight pattern. He'll do two horizontal and then two vertical figure eights. 
So you can see here the patterns are indistinguishable. Um, both systems, the HEC Vive and our system, give millimeter level accuracy. Uh, and this, the HEC Vive, like I said, is the market leader for tethered uh, setups. But the big difference here is we're doing it wirelessly uh, on a mobile platform. And of course, when we're talking about mobile, size means everything. Uh, you can see the, the Vive and the Oculus there, their motion controllers are over four inches in diameter. I mean, you're not going to be embedding that in a mobile headphone or, or a mobile phone or anything like that. Uh, on the other hand, our tracker is less than an inch in diameter, so it's much more portable. And uh, we also have the benefit that most of the technology in our tracker is already in mobile phones. So there's further size reductions if you were to embed it into a headset, mobile phone, or other IoT device. Uh, and this kind of opens the door for a whole ecosystem of new products that are possible. Uh, because of the size reduction, you can do things like hand tracking. Uh, you can reduce the size of it, and people actually want to wear uh, your wearable product if it has a small tracker. But if it's got this big baseball-sized tracker on it, I don't think it's very user-friendly. You have uh, one minute. Thanks. Uh, and so essentially, this is one of the products that we'll be releasing uh, in mid-2018. Uh, it comes with our tracker built in. So you get the full 360 degree room scale experience, you get the low power benefits, and you can interact using your hands and fingers naturally, just like you do objects in your everyday life. And this is all made possible thanks to the tracking technology. Uh, and that's it. Uh, if you want to see any more videos or learn some more information about our technology, please visit our website, uh, zerokey.com. Thanks. All right, thanks. You have my vote for time management. Okay. <laughs> Uh, judges, questions, please. Do you want to use this one? <laughs> so at the end of the day, what do you think is a key use cases to help out the VR from the current state to the next stage? I mean, what kind of use case do you think is going to help? I think it's this. The, I mean, yeah, but I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is that is that more for the entertainment or more for the games or more, I mean, what kind of verticals do you think that this will actually help uh, consumers to adopt VR more? Sure. Um, so I think entertainment's the easy one, uh, especially gaming in particular. Uh, I think the, the fit is obvious there, and that's where people right away can say, hey, I can do this much, do this better than what I'm doing right now. And uh, I talked to uh, someone yesterday, and he put it to me quite eloquently, and he said, you have to imitate the current technology and then offer the next level to make, to give consumers that reason to switch. It's gotta be considerably better. And with gaming, uh, if you try VR with gaming, you can tell the immersion just goes through the roof. You know, you feel like you're there. Uh, a lot of our engineers, after they do VR with room scale and, and moving around and stuff like that, it's hard to go back to the 2D. It's very hard, it's just not the same experience anymore. Um, but we see it in a lot of areas. A lot of areas are actually, you know, progressing simultaneously. What is your uh, planned distribution model? How do you plan to reach your target audiences? Uh, great, uh, good question. Um, so we're actually focusing on a licensing model. Um, our hardware is actually designed from the ground up to be easy to integrate. Uh, so we're working, we're trying to work with some of the mobile manufacturers to integrate this into their headsets uh, at that level. Um, we do have other avenues uh, of potentially selling as an add-on as well, but right now our primary focus is licensing. Right. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, what's the time frame and then also what's the target price point? Uh, so, so time frame, uh, we're going to have our development modules available. We already have working prototypes, but our development models will be ready early 2018. Uh, and after that, it really depends on if we're going the licensing model, it'll depend on the partner we're working with, but we're hoping for later 2018 to have it consumer ready. Um, and sorry, the, on the cost side, uh, the nice thing about this technology is the innovation is more in the algorithms and the way it's set up. So the technology is extremely simple. Uh, so each beacon here is a couple of dollars. So it's very, very inexpensive. The whole solution is probably at retail less than forty dollars. Awesome. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. One more time for Matt Low. So at this moment, um, I'm going to take questions from the floor. 
to the presenters, OK? So we had five presenters, actually six, five teams. So if you have questions, just raise your hand, and we'll give, uh, give it to you, give a mic to you, OK? Any questions to any presenters? No, you presented, so. <laughs> okay, it's competition going on, right? All right, you can ask questions. Mike. Uh, so to the R1 guy, wherever, if he's, ah, uh, hey. So what gives you the main power savings in your hardware? Is it, you know, obviously Intel and other those companies have reduced their manufacturing size and everything like that. Where does the power savings come from? Thank you. Good question. Um, it comes from uh, sort of every level, from the high-level architecture we've designed very specifically for this application to the micro-architecture, um, again, meant to take advantage of uh, the differences in the type of compute done for neural networks and AI applications than from general compute, um, and circuit level innovations where we just build our circuits differently than uh, people like Intel or Qualcomm, um, and combine all of those and get a pretty huge advantage. Um, yeah. Good question, good answer. Any other questions? Any other questions from the floor? None? Do you have any follow-up questions, uh, judges? No? I think we are all busy on trying to make sure okay. that we all right. count our points. No other questions? No? Yes. Hi, I've got a question for the, uh, for the last group. Um, and that is, does your tracking, um, uh, uh, does your tracking device uh, mm -hmm. function without a tracking unit? Uh, essentially, can you do hand tracking w without something that's embedded? So you do need a tracker. Uh, the tracker is very low power and very small. Um, it's one of the requirements of our type of system, and it's the reason you get the quality of the accuracy. Um, without that, some, for example, computer vision and stuff like that is very inaccurate in comparison, and you can't really do a lot of the physics-based interaction. Uh, one of the things in VR that almost never gets talked about, especially when you're talking about the inside-out solutions and the computer vision stuff, is that your tracking has to be perfect. If, you know, it, it's one thing to present to the user that an object may be here and you could be wrong by a foot. That's okay. But if that object is interacting with things and that location is wrong, then everything else that derives from that location, that wrong location, is also wrong. So you get a propagation of the errors and often multiplication of those uh, position errors. And so it's uh, almost a necessity if you want to do something like that to get the high accuracy that you need some sort of tracker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. While um, our judges finalize the scoring, let me explain how you are being uh, evaluated, OK? Each judge will score each company from scale of 1 to 5. Top companies gets 5, second gets 4, and so on. For each judge, companies would be ranked from highest to lowest and receive points based on this ranking. Since there are five companies for each judge, the company with the highest ranking will receive five points, the second highest would receive four points, etc. Okay? And we would then add the points from three judges and get overall scoring for ranking. For the top prize winner, we will give uh, the brand new Note 8. Okay? And the top three teams have a privilege to have a lunch meeting with our judges tomorrow on the first floor of this building in meeting room seven, okay? But all the participants, all five teams, you will get a Samsung Connect kit, okay? All right.
Judges, how are we doing with the um, scores? One minute. For the first place winners, we'll give you this, two if you win, and one for other teams. And you can take this third floor and exchange for note eight. Okay, so if you drop it somewhere, someone else is gonna get very lucky that day. Okay, so don't lose it. This is not a meal ticket. This is for Galaxy Note 8. All right? Excuse me? Uh, next year. <laughs> 2018. All right? Okay. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very, very much, all the, uh, all the uh, startup entrepreneurs. I uh, love your energy and all these ideas, and I really appreciate it that you coming up and then really be able to pitch in seven minutes because it's not that easy. I've done that before, and seven minutes, a lot of times, you really cannot get everything out. Um, and it was very uh, hard for us to judge and every single element with uh, just knowing the seven minutes, you know, we really cannot get the full comprehensions of what you're trying to do, what kind of things that you have done and so on and so forth. But based on what we just saw, right, because without any kind of biased opinions or anything like that, based on what we saw, this is the collective agreements of the ranks. Okay, so should we... Can you start with... Number three, number two, and then grand prize okay, winner. Great. Okay. So number three, drum roll. Third place. Third place. <laughs> Passage AI. Thank you yes. very much. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> and number two. Oh, do we actually give out the prize? No, we will do that. We'll later. do that. Right, right. Okay. Second place. It. Second place. Reduce micro. Congratulations. And final and the first winner. place winner who's going to get these meal tickets <laughs> that works for Note 8 is <laughs> Zero Key. Yeah, Great. congratulations. All right, come on up. Congratulations. All right. Okay. Um, all the participants, please stick around so that we can give you um, our gifts, okay? And the, as I said, the top three winners, you will have lunch with our judges tomorrow at 12, first floor in meeting room seven. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>